Albanese will defend the property bubble at all costs. Martin North, John Adams, the interest people. Hi, John. Great to see you in the studio again. Hi, Martin. How are you going today? Yeah, pretty good. So just after the election, uh, the dust is settling. And the question is, what happens next? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we've done a couple of uh, shows over the last uh, few weeks in the lead up to the election. And uh, so, so the, you know, the, all we can say is that the Australian people have spoken. Um, to be honest, not the result that I had hoped for. Uh, and, and even in terms of what you were hoping for, we were hoping for a shift away from the uh, the major parties to the minor parties uh, and and to some degree we've seen that with with some of the teal independents being elected um, even though I used to work for the coalition I actually think it's a healthy thing that the Morrison government has lost because uh, I mean I mean it was riddled with scandal and there was just so many po poor poor policies and poor pub public policy outcomes that it was time for a number of these people who were a waste of space to go and the fact that uh, mr frydenberg has lost his seat well, you know i mean that is a silver lining in in the whole repertoire but but the key i think essence of today's show is really just to uh reconfirm with our audience martin that a number of the concerns that we've been expressing uh, over the last few years, uh, but also particularly in, in a, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about uh, where we think interest rates, inflation and uh, property prices will, are going to go. I, I think a lot of those uh, warnings uh, and forecasts are still intact. So I don't see anything changing with the outcome of the election. And we're going to go into, um, uh, we're going to give uh, some additional context as to why we think that is the case. Mm. And I guess, you know, my observation is, one third, one third, one third is roughly how the electorates voted. Um, so Labour got back in with a very small relative proportion of the of the vote, actually. Um, so it maybe wasn't so much a popular vote for them, but it was a sort of an anti-vote for the other side. Um, and of course, the fragmented third parties now they're a part of the makeup. It'll be interesting to see whether they have any cards to play or not. But I'm not sure that anything really has fundamentally changed. No, no, and, and and you know when we go to the essence of what we've what we've been talking about since 2018, which is the debt bubble, um, um, in our property show two weeks ago, what we said was that um, the the decision about whether to um, raise interest rates and cause a uh, cause a crisis and cause property prices to go down or or to save the bubble by printing more money this is ultimately a political decision and one of the points that we made at the last show was that there is a consensus between labor and the coalition uh in terms of these policies now yes we have uh, a few more greens elected uh, both in the senate as well as in the house of reps and we have these teal independents um, but uh, do I think that any of these new uh, uh, people into the parliament will have a, a different uh, uh, set of policies or different set of philosophies compared to the status quo? Um, I dare say that they won't uh, have anything different, uh, but I guess time will tell. Mm, well, they may be sort of pushing a little bit more on the climate change angle, but in terms of fundamental economics and neoliberal thought, all of those things, I've not seen any evidence of anything other than same old, same old. Yes, yes. So, 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 so just to recap for our audience, what we said in our property show was that rates would go up. Um, and, 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 you know, even as, as today, um, you know, some of the banks like Westpac have announced uh, a whole host of increases in some of their long-term fixed rates. So, so we are seeing this environment of raising rates, and we have a, uh, we have the RBA meeting in two weeks. And Westpac, the chief economist Bill Evans, has actually put out a note only last week saying that uh, rates should increase by forty basis points, which would uh, be quite a shock because once I, in the last couple of weeks, as I've been uh, talking to uh, people in the property market, and I said, "Are you aware that the banks are calling for forty basis points?" They were in complete shock, and uh, I don't think a lot of the people in the market are ready for that. I think people are expecting 25 basis points and that's what uh, banks like CBA are uh, recommending. But uh, you know, if there is a more aggressive push on, on short-term rates, uh, that's going to have a dramatic uh, impact uh, 
uh, on the market, at least in the short term. And it's interesting that New Zealand, of course, announced uh, a rate increase this week, and they went up by 50 basis points to 2%. And they also signalled more rate hikes ahead. And Adrian Orr basically said, we've got to do this because we have to stop the inflation getting out of control. And already we're seeing house prices in New Zealand sliding significantly, momentum in credit growth, reversing and all sorts of things. So in a way, I think you could look to New Zealand in terms of the you know next few months. However, interestingly, in New Zealand, people are now suggesting that, again, rates will go up and then perhaps come down later. So it'll be interesting to see. Yes. And then when, when people look at the US bond market, um, a lot of people are now signaling that the long term rates have, have peaked. Um, and the market is now already so. So when we talk about the pivot, some people are saying that well, the pivot has already been uh, has is already in because the bond market ha- ha- has sort of, has sort of priced interest rates um, at a particular level and they are coming back down. But 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 to, to like a, so obviously we said rates are going to go up. Pause. They'll come back down uh, in terms of twenty twenty three, um, and then we're and, and we're likely to see negative interest rates. But in theory, by 2024, if if APRA's uh, sort of guidance is, is is if APRA's guidance is any measure, and then we can see property prices go a lot higher in a couple of years' time. So so that's what we said a couple of weeks ago. So just to give a bit of additional context to uh, in terms of the new Labor team. So we obviously have the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. We have the Treasurer that's been sworn in, which is Jim Chalmers, and we have um, the Finance Minister Katie Gallagher. Um, uh, who's who's also the, the former ACT chief minister? She, um, so, so so this is the nucleus of the uh, team that will be making the key economic decisions and obviously guiding the cabinet as to all of these important aspects of debt, inflation, interest rates, uh, and property prices. I mean, these are the key three people. So um, while we can look at statistics and while we can look at uh, what institutions like the banks and the RBA and APRA are saying. Um, you know, these three people are front and centre uh, um, in terms of what are the key decisions that are going to be made. Um, and, and, and so what we're going to do now is just reflect on who these people are and what is their background and history. And, and does that tell us anything about uh, whether our forecast that we made two weeks ago is on the money or are we slightly off? Mm. And it's also interesting to note that already Chalmers has said, oh, there are more holes in the budget than we thought. And of course, today the electricity price rises were announced and it's been now revealed that in fact those announcements were parked from before the election by the previous guy and the previous party, right? So already they've got the first surprise out of the bag and the question is how many more will they reveal? Indeed, indeed. So so, so yeah, so, so one of the important aspects when we think about the Labour Party, Martin, is that uh, we have already covered uh, some of this uh, important history about inflation and deflation in the history of the Labor Party. So so back in, I think, uh, 2020, we did uh, a show called um, Only the Tenth Prime Minister Can Save Australia, and this was about Joseph Lyons and, and his story of being um, growing up in the Labor Party in Tasmania, rising to the ranks of Premier, then going to Canberra and being ultimately the Deputy Prime Minister and Acting Treasurer uh, advocating for deflation um, um, and basically um, keeping uh, interest rates high um, and cutting government spending significantly both at the federal and state levels. Um, and when the Labor Party revolted against his suggestions, including with uh, Ted Theodore, who was the, was the substantive treasurer who came back, he, re- he resigned from uh, the cabinet in March of 1931 Oh, sorry, in January 1931, he then resigned from the Labor Party in March of 1931, uh, was, went to the crossbench, was invited some months later to go into the opposition and become the leader. And that's how we came up with the United Australia Party, the first version, not the Clive Palmer version. Um, and by December of 1931, he won the biggest victory in, in, in terms of Australian history. And, 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 you know, I'll just make one point about this. Any time I talk to people, particularly in the coalition, about deflation, they all say to me, "We can't, we cannot win an election if we pop the bubble because because the consequence of that will be so horrendous um, to people across the country. They'll never forgive us." And I keep on making the point: there's only been one campaign since 1901 where there was an explicit deflationary agenda, and there was the biggest victory ever at 58 and a half 
two party preferred. So uh, I mean, th 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 there's all sorts of misunderstandings about the you know how, what is the possibility or what is possible in terms of politics, um, and 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 that that's obviously. Uh, an important case study. But the other important aspect of this, Martin, is, is that um, in, in, in Labour tradition, both in terms of politics, but also in terms of, you know, all of their intellectuals and, and their academics and their writers who have uh, been part of the Labour movement, they have never forgiven Joseph Lyons for betraying the Labour Party. And he's called the Labour Rat because he basically, you know, turned his back on them and went to the other side and uh, and obviously you know threw them out of power. So 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 so, so this whole uh, series of events that happened in 1929, 1930, 1931 still is 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 part of the main thinking inside the Labour Party about when you have a when you have a financial crisis or uh, or a currency crisis, what do you do? Or when you have a slowing economy, what do you do? Um, and and the motivation, the idea, is to inject more stimulus. And so we have a couple of quotes. So we have a, a book, uh, and we'll put this on the screen, Joseph Lyons, um, The People's Prime Minister. This was written by Anne Henderson back in 2011. So there's a couple of interesting quotes fr uh, from the book. So, quote, uh, the government, uh, these advocates believed, should stand up to the money power, i.e. the banks, um, and expand credit to save jobs and provide relief for working class families. Uh, and then the second quote is, the ALP was meeting in Sydney, accept, accepting a motion for a five-year moratorium on overseas interest payments, repudiation of all war debts, and central bank credit for industry stimulus, work relief, and the unemployed. So, so there is this idea um, inside the Labour Party, but also uh, what I would call, and forgive me for, for, for saying this, left-wing Keynesian economists, that the biggest harm to society is involuntary unemployment. So whatever you can do to stop working people from being unemployed, given that it, that is a such a horrendous situation, you must do. You must use all forms of government power to keep people in jobs. Um, uh, and obviously, back even in in the time of the Great Depression, the Labor Party wanted to uh, expand credit, i.e., QE, um, or, or some version of QE. Um, and basically use that money for government spending to keep people in work and the country and Joseph Lyons basically said no we've got to go through the depression to 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 get on top of the debt problem so that the debts don't expand and we don't have a default um, and while we did have a depression in 19 uh, in 1931 32 and we had the second highest level of unemployment in the developed world we were faster in recovery than the UK or the US Mm. And of course, the uh, mantra of jobs, 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 you know, was very much the centre of, <laughs> of the campaign, wasn't it? On, on both sides, really, there was more or less no differentiation between, um, you know, the previous incumbents and the current government. Yes, yes. So, 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 so one of the key people that was in, that was circulating during this whole period was actually Jack Lang, mm. um, um, and Jack Lang. Uh, was the Premier of New South Wales. And, and, and the funny thing is, just reading about some of this uh, this afternoon, uh, he actually won his election in October of 1930. And, and, and there was a view inside Labor that by his uh, victory in New South Wales, that would send a signal to Canberra that uh, don't go down the deflationary path because, um, because the people think it's too harsh. And yet um, Joseph Lyons stuck to his guns uh, and resigned from the cabinet only about three, three or four months later. Um, one of the other important aspects, Martin, of this issue of involuntary unemployment is this is the whole basis and origin of modern monetary theory. Now, back in 2018, it was one of our first episodes, we, we did an episode called The Madness of Modern Monetary Theory, and we talked about the writings and the speeches of uh, a, a professor from the University of Newcastle called Bill Mitchell, who, uh, I mean, there, there's a number of um, academics across the world who helped put MMT together, but the main um, uh, academic from Australia is Bill Mitchell and his whole motivation around developing this alternative view about modern monetary theory was about addressing this issue in terms of involuntary unemployment. So, so, so th there is a very rich tradition about, about the, the horror of people out of work. And one of the important aspects 
that people need to understand about the Labour Party is the Labour movement started in this country in the 1890s after the banks went bust in 1892. So, um, so we, have, we had a huge uh, property bubble, land bubble in the 1880s. It resulted um, in, uh, now, now there, was, there was an event, uh, I think, in Argentina where they defaulted on a British bank that caused a credit squeeze in, 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 in London. Credit was less available coming into Australia, and that then caused the depression in 1892. And the domestic banks, particularly in Melbourne, they collapsed. Um, and GDP fell 17% over two years. Um, and we had basically a decade from 1892 to 1900, where um, it was a slow grind of eight years of horrendous unemployment to try to get the economy back to uh, some form of um, you know, normality. Um, and in that whole era, era of working people going hungry um, and, and people not being able to um, look after themselves and their family, a whole host of things developed. So we had, uh, you know, a whole host of uh, huge strikes, particularly when it comes to, uh, in terms of the agricultural industry, in terms of the shearers, the whole waltzing Matilda, um, uh, someone who, you know, basically was hungry, stealing a sheep, and then when the police were after him, he killed himself, that this was born in that sort of era as well. And obviously the labour movement came out of, uh, you know, uh, this whole era where the unions were forming and all these trade unions, and this was all about, um, you know, having collective rights so that working people wouldn't suffer. So, 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 so this issue of high unemployment, it is etched in the, the philosophy and the mentality of the Labour Party. Um, and obviously, if there was any, if people wanted to do, or if, if the government wanted to do what we have recommended, and we have recommended in previous shows, your, your famous alt control delete, um, that would, you know, to, to, to address the um, debt bubble and have deflation of some degree, this would cause huge uh, problems uh, in terms of unemployment, but also in terms of uh, hurting uh, people across the country that have too much debt. And we acknowledge that that would be a horrendous short-term cost, but it is the cost that we must pay if we are to come to terms with the um, structural imbalances we have in the macro economy. Um, but, but, but the, the, the key point here is, is that, um, that, that our thinking on this is the anathema of what labor is all about. Mm. Well, you know, the answer is, of course, that you can continue to turn the crank on more debt and more debt and more debt and try and drive employment to uh, higher levels, unemployment to lower levels. But if the overhang of that is just so much debt that effectively you inflate asset prices as we've been doing and the economy becomes less and less efficient and less able to produce anything, ultimately it's going to go pop, isn't it? It's just a question of whether it's a slow pop or a quick pop. Well, well so, so, I mean, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people think that is the case, that it will pop, but it, it actually doesn't have to pop because the counterfactual of, of um, keeping the bubble going is ultimately an inflation problem uh, and 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 to it, taking it to its um, infinite uh, conclusion, it's hyperinflation. Mm. So 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 a lot of people say at some point that the bubble has to pop. No, it doesn't technically have to pop. You can you can expand this um, to to a infinite degree, but there is a consequence. So so you, something will crash, but it's not the bubble, the, the debt bubble. Yep. It, it is the currency. So 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 there is no inevitability that the property market has to collapse because because they are they are basically trying to degrade the currency um to a degree um that 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 they can keep the show running but but i just want to bring the audience's attention to so so jim chalmers who's the new treasurer who, who's been making a number of public statements in the last couple of days since he's been sworn in in 2013 he wrote a book called glory days and um, his background um, uh, is that he, uh, during the GFC, was actually working for Wayne Swan. So for a period of time, he was the deputy chief of staff. Uh, and then I think uh, by about 2010, he became the chief of staff to Wayne Swan. So in 2013, he wrote a book. And, and here's a, a key quote from the book, quote, hundreds of thousands of Australians were spared the unemployment queues and families and communities escaped the listlessness and hopelessness of mass unemployment and social breakdown. In doing so, Australia dodged the devastating carnage that was 
wrought on the suburbs and towns of this last recession in the early 1990s. So, so, so Jim Chalmers was the architect of the Rudd stimulus with uh, Rudd Swan and Lindsay Tanner as the finance minister. And he, in this book in 2013, is defending it and saying that w it was the right thing to do, um, 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 even though the consequences of the Rudd stimulus package, and obviously this is not just the Australian response, this was a globally coordinated response, the resp you know, I mean, without that response in 20, uh, 2008, 2009 by Rudd, we wouldn't be in the situation that where we are now. So, 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 they, so they inherited a cost of living inflation problem from Howard. They inherited a growing uh, property debt bubble that Steve Keen was warning about in 2006 20, and 2007. But what did they do when faced with the consequence of mass unemployment? They saved the bubble mm. by, by driving the country into huge amounts of, 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 in terms of debt. And that, was, that response is kind of part of the motivation why I went to work for the coalition in 2012, 2013, because I just said it was the wrong response. And now we've, we've inherited um, uh, you know, a, a worse economy compared to where we were in 2007. And unfortunately, what the coalition did when they got elected with Abbott in 2013, they made it a lot worse, whereas what we had hoped uh, particularly in opposition, was that we we're going to make it a lot better. <laughs> so, 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 I'm not here to be an apologist for the for the Liberal Party. I mean, they have been horrendous in government, and they've you know blown up the bubble in terms of smithereens. But, but this issue of keeping people in work, keeping people in their houses, and and stop working people from starving. You know, I mean, I mean, so, so, so this is not just modern politicking. Uh, I think the one thing I want to get across to the audience is is that this is. Um, a, 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 a way of thinking inside the Labour Party um, for more than 120 years. Mm, and it's, yes, it's been there a long, long time, and you know, not just Labour Party here, but other parts of the world too. I guess the other point, John, is that the, the quantum of the stimulus we used for the global financial crisis was a lot smaller than the quantum thrown at the most recent crisis through COVID, right, by a, yes. a huge factor. Precise, like that, that I would agree with. Yeah. yeah yes. Uh, but, but still, but it, it, even at that point in 2008, 2009, it was a very large stimulus package. Mm. Um, and, and again, so remember, and we're just going to get onto this very soon. So in 2009, when they did the stimulus package, um, the last recession was actually 91, where they actually did pop the bubble. Yep. But, but before that was the Great Depression. So, so labor. So, so think about it. Labor in, in in the Great Depression wanted to uh, push stimulus, and they basically got thrown out of power by the United Australia Party. Then they actually did pop the bubble in 1991 with Paul Keating, and we'll, and we'll talk about that soon. And then when they faced this problem again by Kevin Rudd, they went back to what they wanted to do in 1930, 31, um, uh, because it was in in, in even in. Uh, Jim Chalmers' view, it was the right thing to do. So mm. now, now the other aspect that I just want to call out here is the finance minister, Katie Gallagher. So, so previous to me moving back to Wollongong, I lived in Canberra for seven and a half years, so I lived under uh, her uh, political leadership, but she became the treasurer in the ACT in 2008 uh, and the deputy chief minister. And then she went on in 2011 to becoming the chief minister and then she, uh, then she retired from uh, ACT politics in 2014. So she was basically uh, running the treasury benches uh, in, in the ACT government, which is to, to, to some degree a glorified local council, given that it's a small geographical area um, uh, she, for six years. And the, and the one key point about Katie is that she ran significant deficits over those six years and she, she blew up net debt for the ACT in that, uh, in that period by about $1.2 billion. Now, $1.2 billion doesn't sound a lot like uh, in today when we're close to a, almost a trillion dollars worth of federal debt, but for a local uh, principality like the ACT to incur $1.2 billion worth of debt over six years, that, that is a big thing. So, 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 the, so the, you know, when we think about Albanese, Chalmers and Gallagher, they are inflationists, they are they are believe in minimising unemployment. They don't know how to balance the books. And one of the other key things I learned about today is none of them have ever worked in the private sector. So Chalmers and Albanese, all of their life, they've been in politics, in political offices, working in, the, in various um, late labour political offices or unions or um, 
in terms of uh, research centres, etc. Now, Katie Gallagher started in the public service in the ACT, and then was a, and then from there made her launch into politics, and now she's the federal finance minister. So um, maybe some people will, will take uh, one view or another, but uh, I mean, all I can say about my personal experience, I started off as a public servant, and I've spent a lot of time. Uh, since then, both in uh, uh, and doing a whole host of different things in the private sector, but also working in federal parliament. So, so for me, the more life experience you have doing different things across Australia, the richer your um, life experience is, and you can make more informed decisions. So, so, so I think it's a slight concern that the three main people um, in the leading the economic team for the government have have no personal visibility about. What is it to be in, in, in terms of business, particularly in terms of small business? No, I think that's important, John. And, of course, it becomes then very much driven by political ideology because that's all they know. Um, whereas, in fact, commercial experience working inside, you know, your own business or other people's business gives you a whole new different perspective on things, right? Not least, of course, the um, stupidity around all the red tape that, you know, every way you look through business, it seems to me that we spend a lot of time jumping over hoops that shouldn't be there. Now, you know, for me, that's an important set of discussions, but nobody wants to talk about that. They just want to talk political ideology. Yes, yes. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's very interesting about the whole regulation area. And, you know, I have experience in this because I worked on the uh, Rudd government's deregulation agenda as a bureaucrat. And then I went uh, in the coal, working for the coalition to formulate their 2013 deregulation policy. So, so there is, there was a movement at the time to reduce red tape, but there is so much, um, there's so much of that Canberra machine, um, and there's a lot of bureaucrats who have no understanding of the outside world other than working inside government, and their impulse is just to push more and more rules and to make things harder and harder. And I mean, only in the, in the last couple of weeks have I heard. Uh, various people in, in, in terms of the business community just saying, oh, I'm selling out and, and um, it's time to leave Australia because it's just too hard to do business. So so, so th there's obviously a very big conversation to have about that. And obviously when we talk about supply-side um, constraints uh, and supply-side cost push pressures in terms of inflation, red tape is obviously a contributing factor in terms of that. Um, so, But, but just to come to, to Keating for a moment now, just to, for our audience to cast our mind back. So we had rampant credit growth in the 1980s. The banks were lending uh, very loosely then. Um, now, at that time in the 1980s, we had a debt bubble, but it was corporate debt and it wasn't um, household debt. So, so it was a different type of debt bubble. And obviously I should just say for the audience, in the 1920s leading up to the Great Depression, we had a state government debt bubble that was being lent. And, and, and we weren't, those state governments didn't borrow from the, the, uh, the local banks. They were borrowing directly from London. So that's why we had a sovereign debt crisis uh, um, um, and a balance of payments crisis because we had um, uh, the London banks basically putting pressure on us to cut our domestic spending and to, and, and to be able to repay what we had borrowed in terms of, uh, for, like in terms of from the English and in terms of from London. Uh, but, but in terms of uh, Keating now, Keating did pop the bubble. So he took interest rates to very high levels to get inflation under control. So um, I think interest rates peaked at around 18, I think 15% in terms of the cash rate, but, but in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of mortgage rates, it was about 18%. And so that did hurt a lot of people. And that led to a lot of people going bust, uh, particularly in the corporate sector, like Alan Bond and Christopher Scase, etc. So, so the question then becomes is, um, why did Paul Keating deviate from the labour tradition when the labour tradition has all about, has been about keeping unemployment low? Because uh, unemployment in, in the 91 recession peaked actually in 1992, uh, around uh, about 10.4%. Uh, and so that was a high level of unemployment then. So, so now, some would argue, um, and I won't mention names here, but some would argue who I've spoken to today, <laughs> that, that Keating deviated from, he turned his back on Labour, and he was pursuing the Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberal line of economics, economic rationalism, and that's why 
he popped the corporate debt bubble and pushed the economy into a, into the biggest recession since the Great Depression. But but there is also a different explanation as to what was happening then. And so uh, we we've talked about this book in the past, Credit Code Red, written by Dr. Peter Brain and Dr. Ian Manning. Uh, and this was a book um, in, in published in 2017. So so there's a couple of interesting quotes uh, that I'll just uh, read out. Quote. Since the Second World War, Australia has suffered five recessions uh, in 1952-53, All of them were induced by the policy authorities using various combinations of fiscal and monetary policy to reduce demand. Two of them implemented to dampen unsatisfactory levels of inflation while the remaining three resulted from rapid deteriorations in the current account deficit, which raised the alarm that Australia might run out of foreign exchange and default on its interest in debt repayments. Fear of this type of economic catastrophe forced the Commonwealth government to choose what was seen as the lesser of two evils, to induce recession that would cut demand for imports so, uh, and so release cash flow to service overseas loans. As the Australian Treasurer might have said in 1990, these recessions we had to have because there were no other way in which the foreign exchange required to service overseas debt could be quickly and reliably generated. So so, so the key point about this, Martin, is, is that uh, what Brain and Manning have argued in their book, and there's also actually another book that we that we were talking about before we started recording this show, uh, John Edwards, who's a former board member of the RBA um, and ha- who actually worked for Paul Keating during this late period of nineteen in the late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties. Um, there, there was an issue about the current account deficit. It was out of control. There was an issue around um, uh, our foreign creditors losing confidence in us. Um, you know, do we have enough uh, foreign exchange reserves to meet our foreign debt obligations? And so by raising interest rates, you create demand for the Australian dollar, um, and then you can get foreign exchange coming into Australia, uh, and that foreign exchange could be used to service the, in terms of the foreign debt. So so what Brain and Manning are arguing is that um, Keating did what he did in 1990 because um, they wanted to stop a default on the uh, foreign debt, um, and that was a born out of necessity as opposed to some sort of ideological predisposition. And, 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 so, and so that's why I think um, uh, Keating is an important case study, but, 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 but I think what we should say is, is that the labour tradition, which we've tried to outline today, I mean, this is an anomaly as opposed to a repudiation of what labour tried to do in the Great Depression, because one of the people pushing for stimulus back in 1930-31 was Jack Lang. And when Paul Keating, before uh, he got into Parliament, who was his uh, mentor that he would see all the time? Was Jack Lang. So, mm-hmm. so, 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 yeah. So, so Keating was um, uh, very much focused on trying to um, uh, keep unemployment low. Uh, but, but, but obviously, you know, in this situation, uh, he, with um, Treasury and the RBA, decided to to, to go down a particular path. Mm. And so, you'd say probably Keating was more veering towards the the hawk neoliberal sphere, right? Whereas Albanese is more on the on the on the on the other side of the equation, right? Uh, we, we yes, so, so that that's another important point. So during this period, so during the recent election campaign, there's been a lot said about um, Albanese being a economic research officer in the whole government. So uh, Albanese worked for a uh, left wing Labor minister called Tom Uren, and um, both uh, his minister as well as Albanese. Uh, oppose everything that Hawke and Keating were doing in terms of the economy. So, so even though um, Keating went down a particular path, Albanese and his colleagues on the left um, completely were opposed to this. So when we think about, I guess, the le- history of Labor, but also these individuals involved, it's all pointing towards not letting the financial system collapse, keeping the bubble going, um, keeping the illusion going, trying to keep unemployment low, and to stop people from suffering um, significant levels of involuntary unemployment and all the social consequences that, that, that come from that. So, so when we put all this together, Martin, th- I mean, what we said two weeks ago um, about that this is ultimately a political decision about what we do with the debt bubble and property prices, yep. um, w- what I think is 
the election makes no difference. Uh, we, we have uh, a new government that's pretty much um, uh, dedicated to keeping the show on the road. Whereas I would probably say the coalition, because I've spoken to people in the coalition, they did it because of short-term political consideration. Because when I spoke to them about deflation, popping the bubble, having a depression and resetting the economy, their retort was always, we, if we do that, we can't win an election, even though I think they're wrong. But when it comes to Labor, there is the short-term political consideration. There's obviously institutional pressure from the banks uh, and, and, and people in the financial sector who'd be pushing the politicians not to do this. But then there's also a rich tradition and philosophy that, that is going to be governing this new government. Um, and, and, and obviously for those people out there who are making decisions in real time about, uh, about whether to, you know, in terms of fixing rates or variable rates or whether to get into a mortgage or to buy a property or sell a property, understanding the, uh, the, the history of labor and the history of these three individuals, which is um, Albanese, Chalmers and Gallagher, I think they're very important factors in whatever economic decision you make going forward. Absolutely. And uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Um, but I would make the point again that uh, I think that many people on the Labour side are quite nervous of the banks and the power of the banks. And, of course, they will probably not want to upset them. Um, yes. <laughs> John, thank you very much. Very important episode. And uh, we'll keep tracking this as uh, things develop, I guess. Absolutely. Okay. Martin North, John Adams, Interest of the People. We'll see you next time.